Well, good afternoon. Um, I, I wanted to just first of all thank you all for being here today. We have a, uh, a wonderful program uh, set up today where we're going to uh, start our three-part series on construction estimating. Uh, we have uh, a really talented uh, group here and uh, we would not be able to put on an event like this without the help of uh, of course, Tabor 100. So I wanted to make sure that we take a, a moment to, to thank Tabor 100 for, for fighting uh, for uh, minority uh, uh, businesses for going on two decades. And this, uh, this organization, or should I say, this uh, building that we sit is a result of the hard work. Uh, thanks to our current president, uh, Ollie Garrett, and uh, the board and membership over the last two decades. So again, we're very uh, thankful and grateful uh, for the relationship and partnership. Um, also, uh, we have uh, a, a great partner with Emerald Cities. And uh, we are, are joined today uh, uh, by uh, Steve Gelb and Rosalind Jenkins. And uh, Ros will uh, introduce herself uh, later in the, in the um, presentation, but I just, I'm really excited that you are here today. Uh, the purpose of this estimating uh, series was really to really provide an intimate uh, look on the best practices on constructing uh, an estimate um, for uh, yourself and your, uh, and your company. Uh, we also want you to see the best practices that companies like Hoffman has been able to master over the years and they've been very successful in public contracting and to me there's no better example that we could uh, use to give us uh, access and tools that will help us navigate uh, through uh, future projects. Those of you that aspire uh, to be general contractors, this three-part series is going to be spot on for you. Those of you that want to, to have a better understanding of other trades, uh, not just the trades that you specialize in, this three-part series is going to be great for you. It's also going to be a good uh, resource for, the, for you that specialize in those certain elements. And so today we're going to be focusing on the civil side of construction. Um, obviously, uh, we are joined today with our uh, instructor, uh, Chris Bjork, who's going to be introducing himself. He's been a great asset uh, for the Entrepreneurial Institute of Washington, which is another partner uh, that we have uh, that put this uh, or, uh, made this all possible. And again, uh, we'll hear from Rosalind Jenkins. Uh, our agenda as, is, is, as follows, uh, we're going to be doing our uh, uh, introductions and our class objectives. Uh, we're going to go over the civil takeoff uh, instructions and then we're going to go through some sample takeoffs. We wanted to really personalize this so you could see how we go through the, the estimating process step by step. And so we're excited to be able to uh, share these best practices with you. And again, because we have such an intimate group, we're going to be able to have time for Q&A. Those of you that are, uh, have joined us electronically, we're going to ask that you raise your hand and, and develop uh, questions in the chat. There's also a survey in the chat, um, and we would encourage all of you uh, that if you're involved uh, in the Zoom to participate in the chat so we can uh, quantify and analyze that information. Um, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about myself um, and then we will get into the show. Um, again, my name is Dan Seidel. I'm the founder of the Entrepreneurial Institute of Washington. I also run Platinum Group. Uh, business development, construction management, and community outreach, and minority business advocate. Um, over the years, I've been blessed to uh, develop partnerships and relationships with firms like Hoffman Construction. And over these years, I felt like that, that exposure was good and beneficial for me and my career, but would be even more beneficial if I could share those experiences, if I could share those lessons and best practices with all of you. 
And again, we're televising uh, this uh, class because we want to be able to share it with uh, as many people as possible. And again, this is uh, through the great contributions and efforts of Hoffman Construction. And again, we, we couldn't be more grateful uh, for their efforts. Uh, so again, my interest is really helping prepare our small businesses uh, to accelerate uh, the growth and development. And we see government contracting as being a resource. Um, I'm going to go to the next person uh, uh, that we have in our presentation, and that is Dave Johnson. And Dave, uh, please uh, go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dave Johnson. I'm a, a vice president with Hoffman Construction, and uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Dan for the last uh, you know, 15 years. Uh, trying to help uh, develop partnerships and, and uh, mentorships with uh, businesses around the area and help to figure out how to how we can encourage others to uh, be successful on our projects and so it's been a, a great uh, opportunity for us to uh, you know develop networks and partnerships with folks to do that and so uh, this series is just another uh, example of things that uh, Dan is uh, helped us with to figure out how we can uh, improve our uh, improve people's skill sets at different aspects of construction and estimating is one of them that uh, obviously is an important part of uh, being successful with uh, uh, with construction so uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, you all are here and online and uh, thanks for uh, participating and you know frankly uh, this is just one building block on getting uh, uh, being part of a successful uh, uh, <clears throat> business and we'd love to help uh, get on our projects as well so that's uh, another networking thing that we'd love to do too to expand networks with people uh, thank you so much uh, Dave thank you uh, my name is uh, Rosalind Jenkins and I'm the economic inclusion manager for Emerald Cities Collaborative of Seattle and thank you so much for the people who are Emerald Cities e-contractor uh, graduates and participants for joining today uh, we have people from the states of Massachusetts, the state of California, and of course our friends in the Seattle-Tacoma area and the state of Washington. And we're going to have a brief poll, uh, but before we do, let me just mention that Emerald Cities works at the intersection between equity and the clean energy implementation and exemplary, bu exemplary building, and we're just delighted for this estimating training tonight and happy that you all participated. We're going to have a very quick poll so that we understand who's with us tonight. Thank you so much. And I would be remiss uh, if I did not uh, take a special moment to recognize the great uh, uh, production uh, team that we have here today. Uh, we are, uh, our video production uh, is being uh, done by an Emmy award winning producer. Uh, Cooper uh, visual Travis Cooper is here and we're real happy to have him a part of this production and of course our 35 year veteran community photographer Tabor 100 uh, extraordinaire member and the secretary of the Entrepreneurial Institute of Washington Keith of fly right productions let's give them all a hand if we're if you can And, and last but not uh, least, um, the star of this show, uh, the man who really is uh, responsible for helping analyze and quantify some of the most complex, sophisticated, largest mega projects in this region. Let's give a, a warm welcome to Chris Bjork. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Uh, my name is Chris Bjork. I am the chief estimator of our Seattle office at Hoffman Construction. I've uh, been with Hoffman 26 years. Most of that spent in estimating. Uh, I've gotten to been fortunate enough to work, look on, work on all sorts of types of projects, from bright water wastewater treatment plant to the space needle re renovations to uh, molecular engineering. I've, I get to touch a lot of different types of projects, and that allows me to get a lot of different experiences, which I get to uh, impart and, and use this training to help make people better at estimating. And that's, that's really the goal. This is, I've worked with Dan many times. This is, I think, the third S in the estimating um, programs that we've done. And I really, uh, it's all about making people better and getting more skills and 
and giving you an opportunity to kind of get into my, what I think and how I look at a project uh, so that you can get that perspective. What we're going to talk about tonight, uh, we're going to look at civil site work. Uh, we're going to look at takeoff and pricing techniques. We're going to cover demolition and abatement. We're going to cover earthwork, utilities, paving, base courses, and then we'll have a, some section where we talk about some of the other elements, uh, the more specialty items about uh, civil site work. So we'll start off with demolition and abatement. And we're going to talk about uh, both building demolition and uh, site demolition. Uh, but before you start talking about demolition, there's always one activity that always goes first, and that's abatement. Um, hazardous material abatement, it's getting the asbestos out of a building, it's the lead out of a building, uh, the CFL bulbs, making sure that you have all that, those hazardous materials safely out of a building before we go get in and start doing the work. Uh, the great thing about that is that there's usually always a hazardous material report. And in those hazardous material reports, it will actually tell you quantities of materials from a survey that they do. Uh, you can rely on those materials, you should always check with um, the demolition drawings and any drawings that they have uh, provided in that report um, as a you know, back check to make sure that uh, there's not maybe an error in the report itself. But you can rely on those quantities and that's a, that's a great advantage. The things that you need to know about hazardous material abatement if you're looking at it are the things that aren't in the report. And that's the access. Uh, what do you have to do to get to the abatement? Um, we actually had a job where we had, were going through abatement. We had a precast facade. Uh, project built in the 60s, so the fireproofing for the attachments of that precast facade had asbestos in it. We needed to get in there and, and abate it. The attachments were behind a column on the perimeter. The only way to get to the attachments to abate the fireproofing was to take the precast panels off of the building, abate, and then put them back on the building. That's not on a drawing. That's not on a, in a hazardous material report. So you have to be able to look at what you, the work you need to do and what access you have to get to it to make sure you realize some of those logistical th things. Because paying for a crane, taking off a precast panel, having outside access to fireproof, and then putting the precast panel back on. That's a lot of cost that if you didn't realize that you needed to do, it's, uh, it's not something you want to find out after the fact. Um, but you also need to coordinate with the demolition too, because demolition uh, and abatement really go hand in hand. And oftentimes, as a general contractor, we want to have both of those scopes in the same contract, because we want that coordination happening at that intimate um, subcontractor level where whoever's doing the demolition can make sure that they coordinate with what's abated and whoever's doing the abatement can coordinate with what needs to be uh, demo demol demolished before they can go in and do the abatement and that there's a coordination there to make sure everybody's working as efficient as possible. Moving on to building demolition, and that's where we're taking a whole building and we're, and we're, and we're uh, taking it all down. Uh, the way that I look at building demolition is by the gross square foot of the building. So take all the floor areas and add them all up, and that's how much um, gross square footage you have. That tells a lot about what the kind of volumes you're dealing with. And then you have to really look at what type of, how are you going to demolish the building? You know, are you going to do an implosion, which is a, you know, on the very high end of what works, what are you going to take an excavator with some claws on it and systematically take it down. Um, you know, the cost for building demolition, it can range from $5 a gross square foot up to $20 or high, even higher, uh, depending on what work you have to get done. Um, the other key thing about building demolition, if you're looking at building demolition, is what are you going to do with foundations? What are you going to do with basements? Because if you're, if you have to pull out the foundations, that is going to be a big deal because pulling out a footing out of the ground um, is, a, is a cost. It takes, takes cost, it takes equipment to really do that. 
And if you're going to grow, you might grind them in place. That's a common thing where you, you take concrete, you grind it in place, use it as fill. If you're going to, if your building has a basement, you need to know, do I need to brace the exterior walls as I take the building down and suddenly there's not a slab on top of it that's holding the wall, the top of those walls up? Are we gonna leave the basement in place? Are we just going to, sometimes you leave the basement in place and you cut holes in the slab to allow water to get through. And then you just fill the basement up with gravel. Those are things that will be on the documents and it will tell you what work you need to do so you can take into that into account when you prepare an estimate and, and what that's going to co cost. Hey Chris, one of the things that we've been caught on before is abatement uh, where the report says, hey, you need to take care of, an ex you know, say, paint of some sort, but it doesn't necessarily say you know, what you have to do with that. And we had an instance where you know, you're, you're demoing walls uh, as part of the uh, the demo contractor and it has lead paint on them. So, and it may not be lead paint to a point that you have to peel it off and abate it, but that is still, you know, lead paint to a point where it has to get uh, taken off to a, a higher uh, quality landfill. And at that point, you're, uh, you know, paying an extra premium for that. And you can, it's a gotcha that, uh, you know, it, it's that not. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's a great point too, especially with dealing with the abatement. Or th this would go into contaminated soils, which you know is, is related to the hazardous material abatement. You need to know where, what level of con contamination that you have, so that you know where you need to take it. I mean, certain certain um, levels of contamination need to take could be taken as far as Umatilla, Oregon, um, because they're at a higher concentration, and that's wh where the facility might be. Some are low enough concentration where you can still take them to the landfill. Uh, but you need to understand what that is so you know where you need to take them because that's gonna, where you need to take it is going to affect how much it's going to cost both in um, transportation costs and the uh, cost to you know, the tipping fees that you have to drop off the material at the, at the site. Yes? percentage and because it's below that percentage I can save you money and if if it is a problem for us to remove uh, species containing material in between another material we can always encapsulate and still save you money uh, absolutely so that's and the name of us as a subcontractor is to help you save money and help us all become successful that's a, a great point so that sometimes with a hazardous material abatement there are there are other ways to um, encapsulate it where you don't have to necessarily abate it. And that's a, that's a great point that um, sometimes you need, even once um, construction has started, uh, don't be afraid to, if you see a way to save money, um, that provides the same level of quality in, at, the, at, at the end of the day. Those are things that we take into account when, even once we start construction on, because uh, that's, that's a value to not just us as a general contractor, but it's a value to the client that we're working for as well. Uh, when we can think of a better way to do it, uh, that saves money, provides the same level of quality. That's a win-win for everybody. Uh, moving on to types of demolition, selective demolition. Now, this is more of the surgery demolition. It's it's going in. You're um, you might be taking de demolishing a floor. You might be demolishing a room. Um, this is where there's a key quantification of scope that you really have to have. You, here's where you will have demolition drawings, floor plans that show what walls are going to be demolished, what ceilings are going to be demolished. You'll have key notes uh, that tell you exactly what scope needs to be in work because they will tell you exactly what needs to happen. Salvaging something needs to, you need to, need to take some care when you remove it so that it's in good shape when you give it to the client. Um, but it also tells you, a you might have one keynote that has some dashed lines around it. That keynote tells you what scope of work needs to be done with that. Uh, a lot of things with selective demolition are making sure you know your logistics. Um, think of how you're going to do the work when you do it. Demolition always has temporary partitions. Uh, oftentimes you are in an occupied building. 
Uh, you may be in a hospital where you're doing t temporary demolition. So you need to have that secure perimeter so that uh, dust and debris don't go out into the hospital, but also so uh, the people who are supposed to be in doing the work know are, have a safe place to work, and the people who are not supposed to be in the, in the uh, work area st are stayed out of the work area and don't you know, go into a place where they could be in danger. Um, that cordons off that area, that, so you, but you have to think about what work and what your sequence of demolition is to make sure you move those partitions and set up the partitions so you have a, a secure perimeter. Saw cutting is another thing that isn't always shown on demolition drawings because you may have a 30 foot long concrete wall, but you're only gonna demolish the middle 10 feet of it. It will most likely show you demolishing that 10 feet, but it won't tell you that, hey, you need to put saw, cut, saw cuts on either end of that demo demolition zone. Uh, so you have to look at that and, and know that what your means and methods are to perform the work uh, and what your means of doing that are. Temporary bracing is another thing. I, we've even seen um, projects where you have to demolish a bearing wall, so a load-bearing wall in a building. Well, to do that, you need to know that you, I'm going to need to put some shoring on either side of that to make sure that as I demolish this wall, the load that it was carrying it has another path until someone can come in and put in the replacing structure for it. Uh, those are things that are means and methods, so they're not always necessarily shown on the drawings. There may be a note that says, hey, you need to shore this, but it, they won't necessarily tell you how to do that. So the means and methods are things that you need to think about when you do a demolition takeoff on what's the most efficient thing. Because sometimes on, if you have a large enough area on a ground floor, it may be the easiest thing to do to go in there, put a temporary partition on there, and go in there with a bob, bobcat, if the bobcat can su be supported on the slab and just start knocking things over. That's, you know, once it's all safed off and if you don't have load-bearing walls in there, that may be the most efficient way to get the materials out. Uh, the last thing that uh, you need to be concerned about with selective demolition is, is your haul off. So you're going to need to load all these, all this debris out and either put it into a dumpster and, and maybe you're fortunate that the general contractor is going to pay for the dumpster and have it hauled off. Uh, maybe it's a large enough scope where the, you need to provide the, the haul off as well. Um, so that means you need to know how much, th how much things weigh. Uh, there's a number of different ways that you can find out how much things weigh because, you know, what does a, a, a drywall partition weigh? Um, you know, pounds per square foot. Well, if you look at, you know, a, um, you know uh, trade publications like the Means Guide or, the, or a local one is called The Guide, they actually do have um, weights per square foot for some of these demolition um, materials and what these you know, construction materials cost. I actually use um, the AISC, the American Institute of Steel Construction, their design manual, which I got years and years ago. Um, it, in the, of all the things, in the back of the steel design manual, it has weights of drywall partitions, <laughs> um, soil, different types of soil, you know, CMU walls. It has, it has all this you know, informa extra information in there that is incredibly useful because once you know the, the weight of everything, then you really know how much I have to, what it's going to take to both haul it off and then to get it into a truck, drive it to some place, and how much of a tipping fee I'm going to have to pay at the landfill to dump everything. Um, the next, the final part of demolition is site demolition. So this is where we're doing everything on site. We're, um, oftentimes there's a, I, I, I see, always see a little confusion on, you know, what's site demolition, what's site clearing? Because um, you, you'll see them used interchangeably on jobs. For this presentation, site demolition in my mind is hardscape. It's paving, it's uh, curbs, it's, you know, benches, pipe bollards, uh, those kind of hard materials there. Site clearing is your landscaping, it's your, it's your vegetation removal, it's stripping off topsoil, 
It's um, taking down trees if you need to. Um, scopes that you will typically find are paving. So you look at paving, you look at the area of paving that you need to demolish. How many lineal feet of curb are you going to demolish? Uh, walls, you'll need to know the area of the walls, and sometimes that takes a little bit of work to do, because oftentimes on a site demolition drawing, they will show you the length of the wall that needs to be demolished, but you need to go to the existing site survey to find out how tall that wall is, and actually piece together the dimensions and the, and the elevations off of the, the site survey. The other thing to always remember about a wall is that they usually have footings. So think, realize that there is more than just the wall that you're going to have to demolish. There's usually a footing underneath it that you're going to have to take and demolish as well. Um, site furnishings are, are counts. You know, it's a, how many benches do you have? How many pipe bollards do you have? How many lineal feet of site ra railing do I need to remove? Uh, the key thing that I've always found with site demolition is to really look beyond the demolition drawings. And it's not uncommon where I overlay a uh, existing site survey with, the, say, the grading plan and find out that the, the actual paving that needs to be demolished might be two or three times as much as shown as on the site demolition drawing because you're grading over the top of existing paving and you don't actually necessarily see that until you overlay it. And, and some of that times is that there's just often so many little parts and pieces and they're you know, in light, you know, faded um, print on the site survey that they don't make it over into that site demolition drawing. But you need to be able to look and overlay that and see what work needs to be done from the actual uh, grading drawings and paving drawings that you're doing that where they show the area of work that you're actually getting into and, and uh, doing that work. Uh, that's the key thing that I would say with site, site demolition that um, is the most frequent thing that you can get burned by is that something is shown, but it's not really shown. So you just have to do the, do the work to overlay those drawings and, and see where those limits of actual work are and how that compares to what you have on an existing site survey. That brings us to earthwork. Uh, move, uh, so the first part is the site clearing. Um, that's the first activity that always happens in earthwork. And that is, are you going to need to take down any trees? Those are in each count because tree can take you a couple thousand dollars to remove. Depends on how big the tree is. It's your clearing and grubbing, you're getting the brush out. We look at that as on a square foot basis um, and making sure that we know that what area do we have to clear to, and because you'll take a piece of equipment and scrape that off. The final piece of that is your stripping. So that means if you read your soils report, so whenever you start talking about earthwork, always read your soils report, because that'll tell you a lot of information. Um, it will tell you how deep you need to strip topsoil off. Now, that's only in your landscape areas. You don't need to strip that off where there's paving. But it could be anywhere from 6 inches to 18 inches. Um, and you, so you need to take that soil off, because it's the organic material that's really not suitable to be used as structural backfill. And then you need to know what you're going to do with it. Are you going to stockpile it on site? so that it can be reused as topsoil? Is that allowed? You need to know, the soils report will let you know, or you need to possibly ask a, a question. Um, they may be allow that, but they may not have mentioned it in the soils report. Uh, you pro might be able to use it as for landscape forms, uh, or you may need to haul it off site and take it to either a, a landfill or um, some other place where you can deposit dirt. Uh, and so then you need to know what's that going to take and where, where am I going to take it, how long is it going take, take to get, take to get for me to get it there, and what's it going to cost for me to drop it off there. Now, if you are doing the earthwork yourself, you may have another site, another project that could use that. Well, then that's something you can think about on, on both the project you're looking at and the other project and ways that I can save money. If this so soil is suitable to be used at another site, well, that's a, an advantage that you might have. Um, th the way, yes? The soils, um, the soils being washed from state, as in from my experience, were fine with lead, arsenic, cadmium in the soil, mm -hmm. and heavy metals. Where are you guys taking that? 
Uh, there are different, um, different places. Um, there are sites lo locally. It, it, it really it depends on what the level of contamination is. Um, it, may be a, it may be a local um, you know, or regional um, landfill site. Uh, it may be on the other side of, in the eastern Washington. It may be as far as I've, I've had um, contaminated soils need to be taken as far as um, uh, Umatilla, Oregon, which is, is you know, a ways away. Um, and usually that's by train you, it takes to get there. And it just really depends on uh, how mu what the levels of contamination are, because that's what tells you where you can, you can take it. Some landfills actually ha can take a certain level of contamination. Um, some can't, so you just need to work with those, um, those landfills. And I, I, don't, I don't know, off the top of my head, I don't know all the different landfills. I usually you know, rely on our, our earthwork partners to uh, let me know, hey, where do you need to take this? And so I can you know, figure out where, what kind of a, a round trip is that going to be? Is it something you can take with a truck? Or is it something you need to think about an all, a different type of you know, transportation method? Um, then uh, the first types of excavation that we talk about is mass excavation, and that is really m molding the site. It's not what it's not is it's not digging out footings. It's not digging out basements. It is grading the site and uh, making sure that the the overall grading plan is achieved, and, and you get to those final grades. Uh, so you'll have cut and you'll have fill. So, and the way that you quantify this. Um, what I use is I use a computer program. But if you don't have the technology, and back when I started, you still sometimes had to do this, and we were taught this, um, the way that you quantify this is you take your, your grading plan, and you actually draw two scale squares on your grading plan, and you pick your, the four corners of each of those squares. So they may be 10 foot squares, they may be 100 foot squares. It, kind of, it depends a lot about how many, um, how big your site is. And you figure out what the, you know, the four corners of the, the final elevations are and the four corners of what the existing elevations are. And that will, you figure out your average, average f finish grade and your average uh, existing grade. And that will tell you whether you have a cut situation where you're, you're taking dirt out or you have a fill situation. You add up each of those squares and then you have a total of, of cut and fill. Now, that is, can be very time consuming. But if you don't have access to a computer, that's the way that you have to do it. Um, and how big do you make those squares? Well, it, it depends. The smaller you make them, the more accurate you're going to be. But it's going to take you a lot longer to do it. So you have to really gauge. And that's going to really be dependent on every, every project. Um, luckily. There's a lot of great software out there that will compute all this for you. And uh, the software that we use, you can actually import. You know, if you've got the, the drawings, you can, it'll actually bring in a, a PDF of those drawings. And you can trace the existing contours, trace the um, final contours. And then you, you hit compute, and it will actually tell you what the difference is, uh, what those volumes are, tell you how much cut, how much fill you have. It will allow you to actually do maps of where your cut and fill are. Um, and the, some of the great things about these is that they're pretty powerful because um, they'll, you can plug in what your stripping depth is. So you, that tells you that it automatically is going to take, if you're starting at elevation 100, but you're stripping a foot off, that means it's going to take a foot off when it starts running its calculations. And it's going to tell you how much stripping volume that you have, so the, the cubic yards of, of stripping volume. But then it's, when it starts computing your, your cut and fill, it's going to tell you cubic yardages factoring in, hey, I've already taken off a foot of soil off of this, uh, which means that your, your quantities are going to be more accurate. They can also, when you have paving sections, it can will actually, you can put in your paving sections and your depth, so your six inches of concrete and maybe six inches of uh, gravel underneath of that. Uh, or if you're in a landscape area, if you've got 18 inches of topsoil you have to put in, um, you can put those areas in and put those sections in, and it will actually lower your, your final grades so that make sure that you have the, an accurate or truly accurate look at how many 
yards of cut and how many yards of fill you have. Uh, when, we're, when we do cut and fill, we use cubic yards. Um, it's volume, but there's two types of cubic yards you're going to, going to use when looking at this. There's bank cubic yards or neat cubic yards is what they sometimes call it, and that's it, what the volume is in the ground before you disturb it. Um, and then there's truck cubic yards, or, or sometimes it's called loose cubic yards. Uh, and that is what that volume is when you disturb it. So when you dig dirt out, it expands. It swells. And when you, if you uh, bring in import gravel in, and then you have to compact it, and it's going to shrink. So if you order exactly one cubic yard of gravel and put it into a three foot by three foot by three foot box and compact it in there, you may be as much a, only fill it up about two thirds full because once soil is disturbed, it's got air voids in it and that it makes it expand. So what are those swell and, shrink, swell and shrinkage factors? Well, the standard rule of thumb that I use is 35% in and out. That's really highly dependent on what type of uh, gravel or, or soil you have because it can be as low as 20%. Uh, it could be even lower than that if you have a really a big riprap type rock where you don't have a lot of fine soil in between it, so there's not a lot of compaction that can actually happen. Uh, but it may be 35% because it's got a lot of compaction that can happen. Uh, the best way to find out what the exact percentage is um, is to actually talk with the quarry that you're, you're, you're dealing with because they know their material the best. And they'll be able to know, hey, how much how much do I need to figure to, if I'm trying to achieve 95% compaction or 90% compaction? Um, you might talk with the geotechnical engineer as well. They may know something about that as well because they've done uh, studies on that soil as well. Uh, but rule of thumb, you know, anywhere from 20 to 35% is usually a very good rule of thumb for shrinkage and swell factors. Uh, the other, another thing that you need to know about is the soil, looking at the soils report is native fill versus import fill. When you read the soils report, it will let you know whether the existing soils are suitable to be reused as structural fill and what the, or what they can be reused as. They may be able to be reused as landscape forms. They may be able to re, be reused as structural backfill. If they can be reused as structural backfill, you can stockpile that on site. You may have to tarp it and condition it and make sure that you take care of it. Uh, but that means that you may be able to take that soil and then use it to backfill footings, backfill walls, um, and actually, or put it as fill uh, underneath the building if, you have, if your building's under a fill area. Um, if it says you can't use it, then you know you need to haul that, you may need to haul most of that off and deposit it somewhere off site. And then every, all the fill that you need for the site, you'll need to bring in and bring in it as either an engineered structural fill or a gravel. Uh, it depends on what the uh, actual conditions are and what the, the drawings actually call for. Uh, it's an important thing to know because import costs a lot more than native. Um, you're not, if you got native fill, you're not paying for the actual material itself. Uh, you're just paying to handle it. Um, so that's really important to look at your um, soils report to find out whether you can use that. The other thing is haul off. And just like everything else, you need to know where you're taking the material. Do you have a site that's a half an hour away? Or do you have a site that's a three hour round trip? So it's important to know because you have to pay for the trip there. And that's, if it takes longer, it's more money. Um, uh, you, so you need to understand that. You need to understand on the import costs, you know, where are you getting the, getting the material from so you can understand how much is that going to cost. Uh, one thing about um, buying rock and bu from a quarry, oftentimes they will sell it, to, sell it to you or quote it to you in tons as opposed to cubic yards. Uh, soil can weigh anywhere from 85, 90 pounds per cubic foot up to 120 pounds per cubic foot. So the best way that you can really um, figure out what that specific soil is, is to talk to the quarry again. They will know what, that, what the pounds per cubic foot of that, uh, that 
different mater that material is. Um, what I usually do is though is I usually just say I need X amount of cubic yards. Uh, whether I tell them it's bank, I'll tell them it's either truck yards or bank yards, and I'll let them figure it out, because they know what it is and they're used to people, you know, having to, you know, companies ordering things by the cubic yards, but then you know, figuring out what that tonnage is, because they have to figure out the cubic yards anyway, because the loads of the truck are measured by cubic yards and not by ton. Uh, so. Work with the core. If you're looking at buying material and that material when you purchase it, make sure you're, you um, talk to the quarries to make sure that you get the information. And if you're getting a quote from them, uh, make sure that you, they understand what you're looking for. Are you looking for a quote per cubic yard? Or, you're looking or do you already know what it's going to weigh per ton and you want it per ton? Um, make sure that, that you, you talk with them and understand, and they understand and communicate what it is that you're expecting and what it is that you expect out of them. The next part of excavation is your structural excavation. That's where we're, we're digging out basements, we're digging out footings, um, and that's where we really look at of a more itemized, you know, surgical type of excavation, uh, where we need to think about how we're excavating it. Are we have side slopes, um, which are, you know, clearing that out so that the soil doesn't cave in on you. Uh, are, we, are you doing a basement excavation with, and are you shoring? That logistics, you need to understand that because that's a different volume that you're going to be taking out. Uh, the, the, when you look at excavations and whether it's a footing or uh, a basement, if you're talking about actually side sloping the, the, the excavation, then the way that you look at it is you're dealing with volumes. You need the volume of excavation you're going to need the volume of backfill that goes back in there. And you need to know the volume of whatever it is that you're putting in there, whether it's a footing, whether it's a basement. So the way that we figure out the volume of excavation is we'll take this trapezoid here. Now, if you're looking at a footing, you're going to want to start that trapezoid a couple feet off of the edges of the, uh, the footing, because whoever's going to come in and build that footing is, needs some space to put formwork in. And they're going to need some space to get a person in there and to get a, put in some kickers to make sure that formwork's braced off. So usually that dimension is about two feet. So you figure two feet around the edge, slope it up at a one-to-one. -one. Now, I will, that's, that's the typical. The one-to-one -one is typical. Always look at your soils report because certain soils may be able to withstand a three-quarters to one or they may need to be more at a one-to-three-quarters where you actually have a, a, a shallower slope and are taking more earth out of it. But you take your average, average length, so average of this length and that length, average width, same dimensions, by your depth of excavation, and then divide by 27. Always, I don't have that up there, but always remember to divide by 27 because that converts you from cubic feet to cubic yards. Um, and that's a, it's a real important conversion factor when you're dealing with feet because all your dimensions are going to be feet and when you need to get it into cubic yards. Uh, as far as the volume of concrete, you'll know what the footing size is. That'll be shown on a structural drawing that it's going to be you know, a 10 by 10 by 2 feet footing. You can compute that volume. The difference between the volume of excavation less the volume of the footing is how much backfill you need. Uh, and then, so like mass excavation with backfill, you need to know whether it's, you can use the native or whether you need to bring in import. Um, one thing that oftentimes you will see, too, on projects is what they call neat cut excavations. Um, and this is particular to foot footing. So this is kind of the, this is the need to, what I need to coordinate with a concrete subcontractor and the general contractor to see if this is a possibility. So neat cutting a footing means that you dig the, whole, the, the excavation for the footing, not exactly where the, the dimensions of the footing, but maybe a couple inches outside that footing, and you dig it, and you're able to dig it vertical because it's shallow enough um, where you, the soil can support a vertical cut. And then the concrete su subcontractor will come in and pour the footing. They won't use any formwork. They'll pour it right up against the earth, and that can save a lot of money. A uh, couple of cautions with that is, first, you need to know 
you can't necessarily assume that. You need to make sure that that's what the concrete subcontractor is doing because if you're the excavator, in this, you don't necessarily have control over the concrete subcontractor. So you need to make sure that you're both on the same page. The other thing you need to know is, is will the structural engineer allow that? Because sometimes the soil conditions are such where the structural engineer says, no, I don't want that. I don't want knee cut, cutting of a footing. Um, also, is your client going to allow it? Because certain types of projects, the client is going to want to rely on exactly where those footing lines are. If you are a lab building, building a lab building, and this is the ground floor and you have labs on that floor, that first person re researcher that comes in may want everything a certain way. The next researcher that com comes in, they may have to run new mechanical lines underneath the slab because of the type of research that uh, researcher is doing. That means they may need to saw cut the slab and run those lines. And the clients don't want to suddenly open up a slab and find that suddenly now they have to do some demolition work of a footing just to get a, a, a line in. It's an unexpected uh, cost that they don't necessarily want to incur. So they want to make sure that I'm not even going to run the risk. You're going to form these up and make sure that they're all uh, exactly how they need to be. So that's just a, one thing to make sure that you are aware of if you go into a neat cut footing situation. Next uh, key piece of uh, site work and civil site work are utilities. Um, your types of utilities, domestic water, fire water, uh, could be sanitary sewer, storm sewer, could be natural gas. Um, also, this falls into under slab footings and under slab drains. Oftentimes, if you're in a wet soil condition, you might have an under slab drain to take groundwater out of the, from underneath the slab. All, most all projects have a perimeter footing drain as well. All covers in here. What you need to know here, pipe, is you take that off by lineal footage. Uh, by material type, so is it PVC pipe? Is it perforated PVC type? Is it ductile iron? Is it steel? Uh, and by size, is it eight inch pipe? Is it six inch pipe? Is it 24 inch pipe? If you're looking at a treatment plant, you may see 108 inch pipe or even larger pipes than that. It's a big cost difference between a 108 inch pipe and an eight inch pipe. Um, so then you have the, the, the pipes, those are going to have fittings because pipe only comes in certain lengths. So you're gonna to need to make sure that you understand how those fittings work. Uh, you may have Ys where the pipe splits or two, two pipes come together. Uh, you may have, you will have 45 degrees and elbows that you need to take into account uh, for your quantities. Then you'll also need to know the miscellaneous structures. So miscellaneous structures, that's manholes. It's clean outs, it's vaults. It's back check assemblies, valves, meters. And uh, with meters, are you providing it and are you paying for it or is the utility m paying for it? Uh, sometimes the utility will pay for it and bill the, bill the uh, client direct. Uh, you need to know those, that, that information because it affects what, what your estimate will be. Um, and then there's the trenching and excavation that goes with all this. Um, and that is, you know, you take a section and are you going to shore it? You know, how deep is the excavation? Uh, that can be anywhere from two feet deep you know, water lines in general are very shallow. Uh, sanitary sewer and storm sewer lines can be very deep. Um, I've seen even on small projects where they get to be 20, 30 feet deep. Um, so if that's a 20 foot or 30 foot deep excavation, you need to know how you're gonna shore that uh, because that's a, that's a dangerous situation if it's not shored. And it's a lot of, lot of money to, you may not even be able to physically have the room to side slope and cut, cut the back and lay it back. Uh, we're gonna do a uh, sample uh, storm drain takeoff so you can get a, get a really good depth about how you look at that in, in a little later on in this. Paving and base courses. So paving, you're looking at asphalt, flexible paving is asphalt, permeable asphalt. We look at that um, on an area basis by the thickness, um, similar to I will say similar to uh, gravel, uh, asphalt companies, if you're buying asphalt, they'll want to sell it to you by the ton, but uh, they will be able to tell you what the you know, area, how much it weighs per ton, so you can either get that quantity, or if you're hiring, you're not doing the asphalt work yourself, you're hiring somebody to do the asphalt. If you tell a, an asphalt company, I've got two inch, I got 40,000 square feet of two inch hot mix, standard hot mix asphalt, 
they'll be able to tell you, okay, figure X dollars per square foot. Uh, they may, and they may quote you in, in just as a unit cost like that because they may, be, may not have the plans available to them. Uh, they may qu quote you as a, um, as a lump sum because they do have the plans available to them. Uh, they may want to just quote you as a, as a unit price just because they may be unsure of what ac the actual end result is going to be and they want to work on a more of a unit cost basis as opposed to a lump sum basis. Yes? to use a material, because asphalt is basically a petroleum product, and you have to put it on hot and greasy, and it's doing its mm -hmm. thing, and, and it's raining. We're in a rainy state. <laughs> and so we're always setting up either uh, caps on sewer lines or some sort of erosion control. What, what, do we do, what do we do for this material? Because we're always saying we want it green. Are, mm -hmm. are, are we concerned? Well, there's a, there's a couple different things that you can do. A, to start with, Asphalt is not the only paving solution. Um, it's used frequently because it's an inexpensive paving solution. Um, it it's costs a lot less than concrete. Uh, but in order to mitigate, you know, some of the problems with asphalt, is aside from you know, the, the petroleum issue, is that it's a hard surface. It's, a, it's, a, it's an impervi impervious surface. So you have to provide catch basins, and you have to provide storm drain and infrastructure for that. And now you have runoff, and an extra runoff, instead of it infiltrating the soil like it would be in nature, it is now you know, running into a sewer, and now you've got a, that cost and that environmental impact. Uh, they do have a permeable asphalt, though, where you can put that down. It costs more than regular asphalt. Um, so it's something that you would need to know as far as you know, materials and types of asphalt paving that you're working with. But uh, it allows the water to actually infiltrate through that. So it's a, actually a less, lesser environmental impact because the, gr the water is now going back into the ground where it, it wants to be. Um, it just costs more. But outside of uh, you know, switching materials, so there's, then that's, that's the best solution as far as switching materials to whether it's a concrete material or a permeable concrete material. They have a permeable concrete material as well. Um, there's also other systems like you know, a, a paver systems that um, can allow water to get through as well um, that have you know, some lesser impacts. Um, you know, it, it, no matter what you put down for paving, there's going to be some kind of environmental impact um, because you know, concrete takes natural materials to, to make. Uh, there's an environmental pack, impact for concrete. There's an environmental impact for brick pavers or stone pavers. It, it's, um, but it, it depends what, what your offsets are, because there's costs associated with all of them as well. Is anybody buying that at all? Uh, there, there are projects that do have um, permeable asphalt on them. Um, there are projects that have permeable concrete on them. There are, co there are concrete paving projects. Uh, there are paver projects. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, and this kind of gets into this other paver systems, there's a grasscrete, which is a paver system that oftentimes they use in a landscape area. So it's a series of um, hollow, um, like precast pavers that you put in that allow, you fill with topsoil and it allows grass to grow through them. So you still have a landscape area, but it allows for like a fire truck to um, drive on it. So oftentimes for a fire lane to, uh, for access to a building in a landscape grass area, they'll put in a, a grasscrete area so that they can still have the pristineness of uh, you know, a, a soil and, and landscaping there without having to make the hard, without, and have that, but still have that hard surface. Yeah, Tim, a lot of times you'll find, um, especially in Washington State, the evergreen construction uh, standards uh, really apply in the housing side, especially multifamily. And so you'll see a lot of, you know, pervious, uh, um, solutions uh, yeah. within their uh, site plans. Yeah, the, the most often place where I see like pervious concrete or pervious asphalt is in sidewalks and, and, and actual walk surfaces as opposed to parking lots and drive surfaces because uh, the, if it's not maintained properly, it, can, it, it will not wear as well as standard asphalt or standard concrete. Um, and it's going, if, you're, if you're driving vehicles over it, it will get more wear and tear than 
on it, and plus you can get you know dirt and debris and stuff into those some of those voids that allow the the surface to the water to get through the surface. Uh, but concrete paving is the same thing, uh, is um, area by thickness. Uh, but you need to know what kind of finishes you have on it. So, um, are, do you have a standard sidewalk finish? Is it a vehicular paving that maybe has a more of a, a raked finish? Uh, is it a plaza where you've got a decorative stamped or saw cut finish? Those are all factors that are going to cost more or less money. Um, so you need to factor that into what work you're being done. Um, expansion joints, you need to know where your expansion joints are and where you're going to break up uh, the pores of, the, of the, the concrete so that you know how much labor you need to put into it. Um, but you, concrete paving, I'll price out cost per square foot depending on what that thickness is. Um, and curbing, you know, the curbs are going to be priced per lineal foot, but you need to know what kind of curb is it. Is it a standard curb? Is it a flush curb where the top of the curb is at the same height as the, the paving? Or is it a curb and gutter system? Uh, because curb and gutter is going to cost a lot more than just a standard curb. And even, um, you know, the city of Seattle the details will have that curb and gutter actually as a, oftentimes as a two-pour um, activity. So you pour the, the base uh, gutter and then you come back and pour the top of the curb too. So you need to understand what those details are um, that it will affect your pricing. Um, and then the, those other systems that we talked about are, are you know, brick pavers. Uh, concrete pavers, uh, stone pavers. With pavering systems, you need to know what, what the details are because they can be sand set, they can be mortar set, so, and that depends on are, they, um, are the joints, are you filling them with sand or are you filling them with, with mortar? What's the base course? Is, do you, are you setting on a sand leveling course or are you actually pouring a structural, a, a slab underneath it? Because if they're on a, a vehicular, setting, you may actually need to pour a structural slab underneath that, um, those pavers, in order to, s to have the right um, area and, and the, the right depth to support the vehicular loads. Uh, and then base courses are, y you need to know are, you know, what, what's the thickness and what are, what are you putting in there? Now this example here is a cut section of asphalt paving and it actually has here a, a two inch top course which is usually about an inch and a half minus gravel. I mean, not an inch and a half, but a half inch minus gravel. Um, and then a six inch base course on it. Um, and that's usually a three quarter inch minus um, gravel. So two different types of gravel, that's two different activities. Um, you also need, you've got an existing subgrade, so you need to think about what am I gonna do to make sure, that, you know, am I gonna proof roll that? Or do I need to spray down a, you know, a basically a commercial grade roundup to make sure that any, no, any kind of plants don't grow through that? Because um, sometimes those are, are called out to put, you know, a vegetative inhibitor there to make sure that, you know, you don't have, you know, a, a weed start, suddenly start making its way through your asphalt paving. Uh, you may put down a fabric as well. Um, those will be called out on your, on your section details. So that brings us to the other side elements, the kind of the specialty systems. And I'm not going to go really in depth here because these are really more specialty systems, but if anybody wants to um, you know, send Dan and I a lot of emails that you want to do a, another class on these, I'm happy, happy to do that. Um, but these are like shoring systems. The example here that you see is a secant pile shoring system where you actually drill uh, concrete shafts with, with steel beams in them uh, to create a, basically a, a wall, frequently used um, in a situation where you have a water. So this is a, off of a, one of our CSO projects that we built. So it's a, basically a giant water basin right next to Lake Washington. So you drill those down deep and they're deep enough where they can act as a cutoff wall to prevent the water from the groundwater from coming back into the excavation. Uh, but there's your conventional sol soldier pile and lagging systems. There's soil nail walls. Um, it also would talk about specialty foundation systems. So piling, drilled shafts, micro piles, um, ground improvements like stone columns that uh, you have to put in uh, to basically shore up and increase the density and compaction and the bearing capacity of the soil itself. Um, retaining wall systems, so that can be as simple as a, you know, a concrete retaining wall. Uh, it might be uh, MSE wall, which is um, 
mechanical s um, stabilized earthwork. So that's a wall that where you actually build up the wall and put tension rods into the soil as you build it. Uh, and they'll oftentimes have you know, face, uh, facing on it, uh, whether it's a precast face or sometimes it's a shotcrete face. Um, but it's another way to do it. You'll actually see if you go up, drive up I-5 and you look at the Linwood link that is being built, you see some of those walls that have where they're building the ramps, we're, we're building the ramps and they've got little precast panels on either side of an excavation. Those are mechanic MSE walls. Those are, um, they're tensioning those panels off each other to make sure that you have a structurally, a structural retaining wall there. Um, other site elements, landscape and irrigation. Now landscaping is, is you know, pretty straightforward. They'll tell you on the drawings what plants and how many of them. They'll tell you areas uh, where you need to put hydro seed. Um, they'll tell you what depth of topsoil to put in um, and where to put it. Uh, they'll tell you, um, and it usually it's a, it's a chart in the, in the drawings, they'll tell you what, tr what kind of trees and you know, at the, on the irrigation side, they'll show you where all the heads are and they'll show you, you know, where your main lines are and where you need to put sleeves uh, underneath um, paving. Site furnishings, uh, those are each counts. You know, how many benches do I have? Um, how many pipe bollards do I have? Uh, those things, you can you know, figure out those labors, you know, fair, the labor to install that fairly easy. The spec specifications will tell you who they want to buy that from, and you can call that vendor up and get a, get a quote. Sometimes some of those the vendors that are right online, you can actually just go online and fill out a form, and you know, within a couple days, they'll They'll email you back with the, with the quote or they'll call you and start talking about it. Um, those are the really the, the kind of the specialty systems that you see a lot in, in site work, but they don't really come up necessarily as frequently. Um, but you need to be aware of them to, um, as far as how they interact with excavations because you know, if you've got a shoring system, that's, that's going to affect how you do an excavation, how you price an excavation. So that brings us to our sample takeoff section. Um, so we're going to do three sample takeoffs. Um, I'm going to do them using the, some of the screenshots that I've done, but very systematically. I've used, taken these off using Bluebeam software, which is a great software to use. Uh, you can do you know, with the PDFs. It's very uh, proactive on how to take things off. There are a number of diff other different softwares out there, uh, whether you use OST uh, or something else. Um, even if you're, you know, using a scale and um, or a wheel, uh, for those of us who remember, remember using those items, um, it's the same methodology. We're just I, now I just use, um, you know, the computer technology to aid and make me help me to do it faster. So we're going to start off. We're going to do a sample of a demoing demoing a room. Then we're going to look at a storm drain, and then we're going to look at an asphalt paving area. Before we move forward, just a quick uh, round of hands. What kind of software uh, programs are we using uh, right now? So raise your hand if you're using Microsoft Excel. Okay. Uh, Bluebeam. Okay. Uh, RS Means. Any other applications that you may be using? What kind, what kind of responses are we getting in the chat? Okay, wonderful, wonderful. I'll be curious to see if there's any other uh, uh, conversations uh, in the discussion. Sorry. Yeah, ahead. no, no, that's, that's great. It's, and uh, just you know, to piggyback a little on what Dan was saying and add to it, the, uh, the summaries I have when, I, when we get to a summary and actually the pricing information, that, those were done in Excel. And while we have our, an, you know, a, a software, a estimating software program, uh, we actually take that, that data and export it to Excel because Excel is a lot easier to um, manipulate when you need to manipulate things. And uh, Excel is a perfectly fine, I mean, we, use, we used to use Excel um, and it's a very flexible way to generate quantities and price things out. Yes? Own software, your in-house software, somewhere 
to make your uh, to do your estimating? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, we, when I first started with the company, we used Excel. Um, so we had a, a number of different Excel templates and that we developed over the years, and you know, and pricing, you know, you know, pricing guides and you know summaries that we used. Uh, we then switched to uh, estimating um, software, so we did a we looked at different estimating softwares, and there's a number we use uh, Beck's uh, Beck Technologies Destiny Estimator, but there's you know Timberline, there's Winest, um, there in eight, there's there's another there's a number um, Cost OS is another one. There's a number of other um, software programs. They all cost money. They all have different costs. Um, they all can do different th different things, um, and so if you're looking at estimating software, uh, which is a whole another <laughs> another um, you know topic, but uh, it's important to to test drive those things, those different softwares, out to figure out what works best for your situation, um, and both in what it provides and what it, what it costs, because uh, you may need some you may need something that doesn't need to have necessarily all the bells and whistles um, for what you do. Um, so you don't need to pay for all the bells and whistles because some of them can get fairly expensive, especially when you start tacking on maintenance, um, maintenance terms and you know, support and service terms. Uh, that can start adding up into you know, tens of thousands of dollars depending on how many licenses you need. Yeah, a lot of times you'll find that they have different modules that they want you to give consideration to. Um, mm -hmm. And then you also have to think about how well it integrates into your accounting uh, system, and that may be also a consideration. Yeah. Please, Rosalind. Hang on, let me get you the mic. So at Emerald Cities, we have been wondering about how best to support e-contractor participants maybe in bidding on larger work. Is there a possibility that we could acquire one of these software packages and allow mm -hmm. licenses to be shared by some of our participants to limit cost to them? Uh, you would need to contact the software companies. Um, oftentimes, I, I know, oftentimes some software companies give, give a license to a particular person and they have to be named who, who that is. Um, but you may be able to work something out on something like that if you, you, if you have a limited amount of opportunities. You just, that's something that you need to get into a discussion with that particular software company for. Um, we certainly, we have something like that with some of like our you know, other software, like uh, the Autodesk, the, the BIM the software, Revit, and you know, Navisworks, where there's a set number of licenses that you can be used. And, um, People, you every time you open up the program, you you check out a license, and if all the licenses are checked out, you can't open up the program. Right. Um, so there there is there there are opportunities there, I think, but you need to really talk with the software companies to make sure what the, what their ideas are. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and actually, we actually the Entrepreneurial Institute of Washington has ambitions of acquiring uh, different uh, subscriptions that will help enhance uh, the, the, f the members and small businesses capacity. The challenge is we're working under the nonprofit environment, which is helpful because they typically give us a, a, a pretty good price. But then we also we have to do we do unfortunately have to pay for those individual users. We're doing that cr currently with RS means. Uh, Pardon me, as well as uh, construction market data. Tim, I'm coming to you. Okay. Yes, that's what, yes. Our, our, our sponsorship with uh, Hoffman, I believe that that's part of the evolution of the relationship. Yeah. The other thing to think about, too, with doing an estimating software, a specific estimating software program, is do the people who are going to be using it know how to use it? because there's a training involved with that. And, and every estimating software, in general, if you know how to, to operate one, you'll be able to figure out how to operate another, but they all work a little bit differently in, in how they, and in, in, in some, some of them are more user-friendly than others. Um, so they're not necessarily always really intuitive on how to use them, but that's something that you would need to think about. One thing for everyone here in the, in the classroom, we have provided, um, because I know some of this gets a little bit smaller 
um, for the people here. We have provided these, these sample takeoff slides for you so you can follow along and make sure that it's a little bit easier to read for you. Um, so starting off, selective demolition. We're going to demo, we're going to demo this room here. Um, and if we look at this, we're going to assume, as far as just an assumption to make this easier, all the partition heights are 14 feet high, um, which is actually what the floor to floor height of the building is. Um, but if we look at this, we've got you know, three keynotes. We've got, we've got note number three, we've got note number two, and we've got note number seven. So note number two says remove existing door frame and hardware. Three says remove existing interior partition and asso associated tracks, braces, anchors, insulation, etc. And seven says remove existing flooring, wall base, and associated adhesive, grout, etc. So you can see that the area that we're going to work in. Uh, the first thing we need to do is to take off the wall. So that's, we know that it's 14 feet high. So we'll take off the lineal footage of it. Um, that lineal footage is uh, about 40 feet. Um, so that will help us to be able to generate the square footage of wall, which is what we need to both find out how much, is w how much weight that we have for it and, and how much labor we need to use to, take, to uh, demolish the wall. Second item is to look at the uh, interior door frame and hardware. That's an each count. We've got one each right there. Um, so we'll note that in our summaries. And then we will take off the flooring and wall base. And one of the great things when you're using a, a Bluebeam type software is that when you take off the area, it tells you the perimeter as well. Um, so you can use the area to, for the flooring and the perimeter to take off the wall base. So that tells us that we've got about 90 squ square feet of flooring. And then you know, when we get to what the, if we move to what that Bluebeam summary is, um, it will tell us that we've got a perimeter of 38 um, lineal feet. So this tells us, and this is, you know, I will caution this because this isn't, we're looking at estimating and not how to use Bluebeam. Um, this is cleaned up a little bit for, to make it a lot easier. And that Bluebeam does take a, has a little bit of a process when you export your quantities into Excel on how to get them into something that's a little bit more readable. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a straightforward process, but there is a process with it. Um, so there's, there's what your quantities are. So you have your quantities in a nice summary format so you understand what the work is that you're, you're going to be pricing. Now, Chris, really quick, go back one screen. And so in this case, uh, this is a one action. Uh, you decide that you're going to uh, calculate the measurement, uh, in this case, for area. You identify what the scale is. And then you click and you hold and drag over that area. So it's really a, kind of a right. one click or two click kind of action. And it, it can be. So, so on, using Bluebeam, you know, if you've got a nice square like that, yeah, you can click one corner and draw it to the opposite corner and you'll, it'll draw the square for you and compute the area and the perimeter for it. Um, if you've got an unusual shaped area, you can click on each point and, if, and you can click around curves and s so that you can actually create that area there, and it will still tell you the area and the perimeter. Um, you can actually also take off out areas. So if you have a, a, a slab or a, a, an area with a hole in the middle of it, you can go back through and click on a button that will allow you to take out the hole. Now, the caution with that is that it will compute the area without the hole, but the perimeter is the perimeter of the edges. So the perimeter will include the perimeter of that hole. So it's something that you just need to be aware of when you do, the, do, the quanti do your quantities because if you're looking at, um, the, you know, say, curb around the area, but you've got like an area where it doesn't have curb in the middle of it on a paving section, um, but there's a hole, say there's a you know, like landscaped area in the center of it, well, you m might want to take off the, per the edge perimeter in a separate action uh, because you don't want to put curb where you don't have curb. And, you, and if you just took the perimeter area of a area with a block out of it in it, you're going to get to have that lineal footage of block out in there as well. And if you've got the lineal footage of block out in there and it doesn't have curb, but everything else does, then you've got too much curb in your estimate. Thank you so much. 
So then we will move on to you know, what the estimate summary is. Um, and this is how we really price out the estimates. So these, uh, here's our, our quantities there. We've got our square footages. We've got our each counts. Um, and over here, we have what I've looked up for me in my steel manual, um, weights of unit weights of the different materials that we are demolishing. Um, so that I can compute that we've got two tons of material. We've got two tons of material to haul off. Um, this particular job, the general contractor is going to do it for us. So we don't have to worry about disposal fees and tipping fees. Um, but then we, uh, to price it, we look at our pr productivity units, which are going to be how many hours per unit do you have? So uh, hours per square foot hours per lineal foot, hours per you know, cubic yard, uh, does it hours per ton for the haul off. Um, the quantity times the, the productivity unit tells you how many hours total you have. You sum up the hours. And then with this, I've done a back check on this. Because if I see I've got 46 hours. And if I have 46 hours and I've got one week to do the work, that tells me that I've got 1.145 men or, or workers per um, week. Well, I don't have 0.145 workers to put on a job. <laughs> um, so in this case, I've said, well, I'm going to have, I'm really going to have two workers there because I'm not going to have one worker do the work. I'm going to have two workers do the work. And they're going to still take a week. So I need to add some hours. I need to add 34 hours in there to make it bring it up to 80 hours so that I have two workers for one week. Uh, so once I have that, those hours, then I can figure what my wage rate is. For, so for here, I'm figuring that 110% of a laborer's wage, because one of those workers is going to be a foreman, and one of them is going to be a journeyman. Um, so I need to factor in a little bit more in that wage rate. And then I'll sum that up, put on my labor adders, which we'll talk about later on in the, in the project. But that's your tax, your fringe, uh, allowances for small tools, any kind of overtime allowances. Sum that up, and then put on your markups as far as your tax on your materials. Yes? So is that kind of how you would price against like, risk? Or, I mean, your job's 46 hours, and you're rounding up. guess what I'm asking is like ultimately how do you manage price when there's things that come up that you didn't expect it sounds like you're pretty thorough but sometimes that stuff comes up do you just t take a hit on profit or do you basically plus hours well you know that ends up getting right down to a uh, you know kind of a business decision um, and so that's that's where you get beyond the science of estimating get into the art of estimating um, so Yes, um, if I look at the project and if there's an added risk there, I can do a couple of different things. I might put in a few more hours because I think mm, I might need a few more hours here because this is, I think I can do it for this, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not confident enough in it. And I don't think, and then I've got, or I can, might put in a little bit of just a straight dollars for contingency in it, or I might increase my fee for it because there's, there's more risk there might be more need to be more reward at the end of the day. That all has to be weighed against if I'm bidding a job with every dollar that I put in to that job to mitigate risk, maybe one more dollar that's going to push me over the top of the low bidder. I mean, at that level where you guys are at, Hoffman, right, do you guys, is it, is it, it sounds like it's an individual, uh, per estimator kind of decision. It's not, there's, is there like a sort of standardized way to, to manage risk as a, a factor of 1.2 on just about everything that goes in, or 1.1, 1 .1, you know? You know, I, I've seen some of that be in the past, but I, I don't subscribe to that theory because I think that um, risk is a business decision. And so what you want to do, though, is you want to re review. So if, you know, what we will do oftentimes is I'll send out my estimate 
and I'll review it with the, you know, maybe the, the junior estimator who's done the quantities or, or has done some of the pricing for it, and I'll review that. I'll have an executive look at it. I'll have the project manager look at it. Sometimes I'll even bring the superintendent in and, and, and have them look at it as well because they might look at the man hour or at, the, at the hours and say, you're way off. You're, 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 you're in left field. It's going to take you twice as much as, as that. Um, and so I need to know that because if the superintendent who's out there going to be running the work thinks that it's going to take twice as many hours as what I've estimated, and I'm looking at historical data on what we've actually done, I need to know why he, th why he or she thinks that, because it's an important, an important knowledge on making sure that we've got the right number. Um, but so, so that's, that's where I say it, and I think every job is different. Um, some jobs have a high degree of risk. You know, you take the Space Needle renovations, high degree of risk. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that and and yeah. If if it's something that's shown on the drawings and you just missed it, yeah, it's a hit on profit. Um, or but hopefully, you know, oftentimes what I found is that sometimes those things that happen that are hits on profits, you might have other areas where you have gains on profit, and so they can, and so they'll equal them out. You know, an example of that might be, you know, as a general contractor, I may put together an estimate. And I've got different bid packages and scopes of work, but I'm, I don't have actual bids yet. Um, so it's an estimate. So I, when I go in, I expect some of those bids to come in over my estimate. And I expect some of those bids to come in under my estimate. But I know that overall that pr on that project, it should come in really close to my estimate. Um, so just when you translate that into a more detailed um, work, and, and I understand this because uh, w in previous things that I've done with the company, I've actually been the project manager for our subsidiary that does the concrete work, self-performs concrete work on um, semiconductor plants. So I've looked at those details where we are looking at you know, a detailed minutia of, of estimates and cost codes that we're tracking our costs on. And some of them are going to be, we're going to, ma we're going to have exceed our hours on. Some of them we're going to beat our hours on. But ultimately, you know, I'm looking at you know, where those are because if they're large numbers, I want to know why to make sure that my estimates are better next time. But I'm also going to be looking at that bottom line to make sure that that bottom line is evening out and we're still st tracking where we need to track. You, you know, one thing um, I will say about being an estimator, and it's, this is a quote that um, former uh, head of Hoffman said about one of our head estimators, that he couldn't understand why anyone would want to be an estimator, because we're never right. <laughs> <laughs> we're either too high or too low. And that's, you know, that, it goes with the territory that you have to understand that what you're doing was, we may have a better knowledge of what things are going to cost, but we're still estimating. And so we, what we try, are trying to do is to get that number as close to the number that we think is, po is right that we can. Um, and then we think and use that art of estimating the experience to you know, cover some of that other, th those risk factors to make sure that the company feels comfortable with where that estimate. Yeah, there's some consensus involved in, in, in any kind of risk mitigation. Um, and then do you guys <clears throat> offer discounts to more attractive clients? Or is that a typically a thing we, where you might want to like, cut a little of what you can just to take a good hit? Well, that's always a business decision that that you get into when you when you go after a project, you know, when you put your fee percentage on, you, what what your fee percentage is is what you're willing to do the work for for the risk that you're taking. Yeah. For the, we got people online too, Ryan. All good questions, and I think you know part of what I wanted to address before we moved on to the next slide. And I was going to actually put Shelton 
uh, on the spot right here. And, you know, what we were talking about is, you know, it's one thing to, to say it's going to take a certain amount of time uh, to do something, but then there's impacts that p impact productivity. And I just kind of wanted to get a, just a quick comment on things that impact productivity in, in your line of work that could impact the labor rate. Well, one of the things that definitely is an impact is who you're working for. Uh, be very, very careful who you're working for and you know how they run their project. Some general contractors you can do very well on and others you're going to lose your shorts because they're not organized or the state tra trades are stacked or uh, the way the job flows just doesn't allow you to make money. So just knowing who you're working with is very important. Go ahead. Okay. And then we're going to have some comments online, and so if there are some questions, please let us know as they come. All right. So um, every, excuse me. Everyone right. online, now would be a really good time for you to go to the Q&A tool and put in some questions. There are no questions open in the Q&A tool. And now that we seem to have the um, sound and pictures moving together and we are in this takeoff, would you please put any questions that you have into the Q&A tool that you'll find on your pop-up bar at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them. Ask your questions now. Thank you. Okay, so we'll uh, um, get through, go through this a little bit quicker here. Um, storm drain. So storm drain, we talked about lineal foot of pipe. So you've got a plan view. You've got a, a uh, profile. Now, when you're looking at profiles and you're looking, if you're going to um, scale something off of a profile, you need to understand that most profiles have a different vertical scale from the horizontal scale. Um, so, and that's just in order to make things look a more cleaner on the, in the profile. But the profiles also usually tell you what lineal footage is to actually use. So that's really nice. So this, this storm drain, we're looking at this section from here to here. It says 29 lineal feet. We've also got a trench section right there um, on what this trench needs to look like. So taking off the 8-inch ductile iron force main. And force main just means that it's a pumped storm drain. So instead of water this flowing downhill, it's flowing uphill because it needs to go uphill to get to where it needs to go. Um, then we need to get our information from the trenching thing. So we have two points. They're both going to have different starting elevations and, and, elevation, and uh, existing elevations. So if we look at the first point, we compute it out. It's a depth of 3.92 feet. The other side's 5.21 feet, taking those averages. Um, and then we also know that the bedding depth from the dimensions is going to, that's going to be a, a foot and a half. Those are key information. But what we also need to know is that at five feet, we cannot just let the soil stand straight up. So we would need to either side slope it or use a trench box. For this exercise, I'm going to say we're going to use a trench box, um, just so that you kind of see how that all puts together. We will also assume 100% export and 100% import. So everything we dig out has to go off site, and everything that comes back in, we need to bring, pay to bring it back in. So quantity formulas. Your pipe length, you need to know. It's the length from your takeoff. The trench width is per your detail, 3 foot 4 inches. The volume of excavation is going to be that overall um, length, average length times the average depth, so if average the one side and the other side, so the 3.92 and the 5.21, average those together um, and figure out what that depth is. I think, believe it's about 4.57 feet. Um, and there's your depth. You've got a width. You've got length depth times width times depth. You've got a volume. Then we need to compute the, the bedding. So that's what's going back in. So the bedding, we know that it's 3 foot 4 wide times the length times a foot and a half deep, less the volume of that pipe. So we need to compute the volume of the pipe, which is the length of it um, times the cross-sectional area of it. That's pi r squared. So it's an eight inch pipe, radius is four, four inches. So pi is 3.14, compute that all together. Um, and you, you get a really small number because an eight inch pipe isn't, isn't very large. But then the volume of the backfill is going to be the volume of excavation, what you took out, less what you put back in. So it's the volume of the backfill plus the volume of the pipe, because you remember for your volume of your backfill, you took out what the volume of the pipe was. So you need to add that back in when you compute the rest of the backfill for that. Your trench shoring 
so your, the, your trench box is going to be um, a square footage of shored area. So it's the length of the excavation times the average depth times two, because uh, you have it on both. You'll have it on both sides. So here's an Excel spreadsheet that I've worked at to you know compute all this stuff up. All those formulas I just talked about are inside those in those computations to make sure that you are computing things right, and it gives you the quantities that you need to know to price out the work. So you price out the work. Um, you got the, the force main, 29 lineal feet times $125 a lineal foot. Um, and then we've got the trenching excavation. Um, and we figured your bank yards for the excavation, we figured truck converted that to truck yards, adding 35% for the haul off of that excavated material. Then we figured importing on the bedding and the, the trenching, the, the general trenching backfill. Um, and it figured those at truck yards as well. So the, the neat volume that we did times the 35%. Uh, and then we added in you know, $5 a square foot for the, the trench box shoring um, to get us a number. But one thing, if you go back on, on the drawings on this, this section cut, right here, there's a note here that says verify invert elevation location of existing four inch gas line. That's a note that you need to know because if you've got a four inch gas line, you're not using a piece of machinery to excavate in that area because you don't want to hit that gas line. And a four inch gas line is a, is a larger gas line. Um, so, We've added, what I've done here is I've added a premium of 50% of the cost of excavation to account for where I'm going to need to hand excavate. So I'll save some money because I, I can have the, the backhoe going off and working someplace else. But the labor to excavate that is going to be less productive when I have a worker in there with a shovel. You take that. Um, I've priced this out as if I'm subcontracting the work. So these are subcontracted numbers put on markups as far as my taxes, my fees, my insurance requirements, um, you know, how I'm going to staff to uh, you know, manage the project. Um, and we have an overall price of about $11,000. Are those the unit prices? Are these unit prices that you have for this uh, sample, are they fairly uh, current? They're, they're in the right range of, of current. I mean, in this market right now, current you know, is <laughs> can be a little bit of a of a of a, of a of a guessing game depending on what material you're talking about, but <laughs> but yeah, no, they're, they're I've I've used some uh, you know you know past projects that I've I've worked on and made sure that the the units are fairly close. Last thing we're going to talk about is asphalt paving. So asphalt paving, we are going to look at an area. Um, so this is off of our Wazoo Tri Cities job. We've got a, a service lane that comes in with a big uh, turnaround at the end of it. Um, so we've got our paving section right through here. We've got our, what that section looks like. So we can go through and we can take off the asphalt paving area, uh, about 70, uh, a little over 7,000 square feet. Um, we're not worrying about the curb, so we're just looking at the asphalt here. But what we do need to know is what that section is. What does, what does that area get us? And that gets us two inches of hot mix asphalt it gets us two inches of the top course, which needs to, we need to price that out in cubic yards. It also gets the six inches of the base course, which we need to also need to price out in cubic yards. And we also need to prep and prep that subgrade to make sure that we account for what work we need to do to prep or proof roll that subgrade to make sure that the subgrade is in the right condition. So for something like this, I would actually just do all those formulas right in the summary because I've got an area and then I can compute everything right off that one area. So 77,000 square feet of, or 7,700 square feet of asphalt paving. And you've got the, the truck yards and the square footages uh, that follow with that. Uh, again, priced out as if I'm hiring a subcontractor to do that work. Mark it up. Um, get your, you know, your taxes and fees, et cetera, on it. And you come up with a, you know, 54, 000, a little over $54,000 to do the work. Um, and that's really uh, w the sample takeoffs we have, uh, the last section we have. And we already started getting into this is the pricing considerations. 
Uh, what do you need to think about when you price? And that's labor production, labor rates, material pricing. It's logistics and markups. And we've talked about some of this, so I'll, I'll be able to go through it a little bit quicker here. Um, labor production is hours per unit. Now, where can you get that information? You can get that in a trade, mag trade publication, and RS Means will have productivity units in there. Um, if, I run, if, if I run into something that, where I need to price something out in labor and materials, and I haven't, don't necessarily have a good historical uh, productivity unit to you, I'll go to RS Means because the, the productivity units are fairly you know, reasonable to use as a good starting point until I have better information. Um, the, uh, there's a public, local publication called The Guide um, which has information um, similar to that, except it's local to uh, the Northwest. Uh, but the best place where you can have is in-house productivity units. Uh, and I will say this, if you are not tracking what you are actually putting in place in the field, and not on a, just an overall job base, but you know, how many hours per square foot of plywood it, when I'm putting in plywood, or how many hours per cubic yard of gravel fill when I'm compacting it, um, if you're tr not tracking that, you should be, because that gets you that historical cost information so that you know what your crews can do out in the field. And then you couple that with the knowledge, your knowledge of the project and the, you know, the, the challenges you ran into and the efficiencies you gained in that, you can start saying, looking at those historical units and saying, okay, I know I can do better than that here. Here I might need to, to you know, increase this unit a little bit because I know I'm gonna run in, I may run into some problems here, um, or at least historically I have. Um, that gets you that information. And it's really important because you know, the, the past knowledge really can help guide what we look at in the future. Plus, when you're uh, out in the field tracking this labor, you can track how you're doing against your estimate. And that way you can understand if you need a course correction um, in how, you're, how the job is being run earlier than towards the end of the job when it might be too late to, uh, to salvage it. Yes? It's also important to know your production rates on crews. Some crews are a lot more efficient than others. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's important to know, you know, that goes into you know, how busy the market is and what kind of a crew am I going to be using. Doing crew-based estimating, too, is a good, good check. Um, you know, a lot, some companies will say, hey, instead of estimating by productivity unit, I know that I've got a my excavation crew is a two laborers and a, an operator. And they can put in 100 lineal feet of pipe per day. And that's so I've got you know, how many day, lineal feet of pipe, and that's going to turn into how many hours that I need on the labor side. Um, I've used it as actually a back check, a great back check. So I'll sit down with, you know, using like for concrete estimating, I'll go through with our productivity units. I'll sit down with the superintendent who's out, been out there running the work, and we'll do, we'll do the same th estimate, except from his perspective on what crews, what size crews and what durations he's gonna use. And that's great because that is a back check on your, if you come up with a, a close, two numbers that are close to each other, you know you're looking at the same job. If you come out with two numbers that are far apart from each other, well, let's talk about what's, what's the difference. Um, because there may be a, just a disconnect on how you're looking at the job. And I, you know, when I've done this with superintendents, sometimes they're right, sometimes I'm right, because we have come at it looking at two different ways. But once you get to that, um, you know, the closeness of both agreeing on the, on, on the estimate, that way you know you have an accurate estimate because you're both looking at the same project two different ways and coming up with close to the same number. Um, labor rates, so, you know, are you a union shop or are you an open shop? You know, what's your base wage? Um, what are your labor adders? That's your payroll tax, your payroll fringes, uh, workman's comp insurance. Uh, you might have some scheduled overtime. You might have some, you wanna allow something for some casual overtime, just knowing it, hey, I know that I'm gonna have to work a crew uh, a couple extra hours every so often, and that's gonna be 3% of the labor costs. Um, and so you need to factor that in into your, your wage rates. Um, then there's the material pricing, talking with your vendors, your subcontractors, making sure when you, you get quotes from that, making sure that you, they understand what you're looking for and you understand what they're going to give you because undoubtedly they're going to exclude something that you need to plug a value in for. And, you, and if you can work that out and have that good communication up front, then you have that pre-plugged and you're expecting it and you're not trying to figure it out on the fly because uh, that 
that can be a little bit nerve wracking and if you're bidding a job to suddenly, oh, what's this going to cost? Um, and if you bid jobs, you've, you've been there. <laughs> but uh, so just making sure that you have that communication with your vendors and subs to make sure that you both understand what the expectation is. Uh, equipment pricing, you know, are you renting from a third party? Are you renting from, do you have your own equipment that you're renting to yourself? Is the project large enough and long enough where it makes sense to buy the equipment as opposed to renting the equipment? Which then you may have some maintenance costs after the fact, but you can then rent your, the equipment to yourself and the, you've paid for the equipment already. So that might be another um, you know, profit center if you're renting to yourself. Um, and man, but you've got that added cost you know, to make sure that you maintain and manage the upkeep on that equipment. Then the, the next part of you know, pricing is the art of estimating. It's the logistics. Schedule considerations. You know, when is the work happening? Is it happening two weeks from now? Or is it happening a year from now? If it's happening a year from now, you need to make sure that your wage rates are right because in a, in a year, your wage rate is going to be higher. Your material pricing may be higher, and you need to factor that escalation in if you're going to take the risk on it. Uh, is there adequate time in the schedule? There may be a very good reason why a general contractor has allowed um, you to do two weeks' worth of work in one week of, of time. There may be other schedule constraints that that's the only way to get it done. And you need to know that, hey, I'm going to have to double shift this to get that two weeks in. Well, there's a cost impact to double shifting something. Uh, if that second shift is you're going to pay them eight hours for seven and a half hours worth of work if they're, un if they're a union, if you're a union contractor. Um, and you need to know, understand how that's going to work. Um, and what work will be in your way. And that means looking at not just your scope of the schedule, but the rest of the schedule too. Because it may be very apparent in that schedule that say what's, you know, an example from the UW light rail station where the way that we constructed the project, we actually had to put the escalators in before we finished the concrete work. So as we were building slabs, we had to shore around the, the escalators that were already set, set in place and make sure that those were protected and shored against it, which altered our shoring pattern because we could, obviously couldn't put shoring towers right where the escalator was. It's a key, key thing. You need to understand what, what your points of access are, what work is going to be in your way so that you can price it effectively. Uh, Hoist, things like hoisting, you know, who's, who's providing it, those are things to understand too, where your laydown and storage are. Do you have laydown on site or do you need to have a warehouse to maybe to store pipe? Um, and that's a cost. If you don't have it in your own, own yard, you may have to rent, rent some place to store materials. And finally, the markup structure, and I'm going to touch briefly on this because this is really, this is a whole other session to talk about markup structures. And we are planning on, on doing something about this and, and this using a, a structure of this, but that's your general condition. How are you staffing the project? Project managers, superintendent, non-productive foremen, superintendents, um, you know, general requirements, your, your, tra your trailers, um, you know, the, the labor you have that's not really doing any, you know, actual direct work, but is helping make sure everything's clean around the site and your work area is clean. Uh, insurances, your general liability, your, your um, insurance, your workman's comp insurance, your builder, if you have builder's risk insurance, if you're doing something design build, you're, you might have to carry uh, errors and emissions insurance for the design work. Um, bonds, do you need to carry a bond? Do you need to carry bonds for your, your third tier subcontractors? Um, you need to understand that, what, the, what those costs are, taxes, and then obviously your, your fee. So what are you willing to do it for? Um, and that's, you know, we've already had a large discussion about fee there. So uh, with that, that's the, the wrap up. So talk yeah, about real, questions. Yeah, really quick before we, we, we start to get into the questions, I'll uh, go back on the, on, the, on the markup structure. You know, on insurance, you know, most of us as business owners, you know, have general liability. Uh, some of us have even professional liability. Um, what you also need to understand is that uh, your labor, uh, bless you, has uh, 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 markups. And sometimes, you know, that can be, you know, something that it's a cost to your labor. And so if, for instance, you, you thought you were going to have 200000 in payroll and you had 500000 in payroll, guess what? <laughs> your insurance company that is, you know, providing, you know, uh, that umbrella for you will, 
uh, you know, bless you with some <laughs> additional <laughs> <laughs> fees as it relates to your next year premium and so forth. So you always want to be aware of that. Also, in, in, in labor and industries, that's something that, you know, f f sometimes folks aren't not necessarily taking into consideration. Whether you, if you're doing the work inside or outside, what, what craft is actually performing that? And so you want to make sure that you've incorporated that into your, your labor. And sometimes, you know, if you're a, a member of a trade union, uh, there may be other, you know, costs that you, you want to make sure that you have them included. And like, uh, for instance, with Hoffman, they have some of their projects, major government projects, uh, they, they take years to deliver these projects. And so parking for a journeyman uh, tradesperson every day in downtown Seattle, for instance, mm -hmm. <laughs> can be, you know, $20, $30 a day. Right. And, and, and so that's a real cost. And so what I want to just make uh, a point is make sure folks understand and appreciate the cost that it, that it takes to get an individual uh, on your job. We have some questions and I know our participants also have some questions. So I want to start with those folks that are online because they haven't had an opportunity. All right. Well, I'm going to pass the microphone uh, to our participants and see. Uh, if there's any other thoughts or questions that they may have. And thank you very much, Ryan, for the great questions. I have no questions. <laughs> You're going easy on me. Um, not actually. This is your chance. If you have any questions, we would like to hear uh, your questions. And clearly, we had a few little technical difficulties. And what we're going to do is send everyone the slideshow. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can make Dan Seidel available to gather questions, answer questions. And if they need to be addressed to Chris Bjork, our instructor, or others with specialties, we will make sure those connections occur. So just to uh, wrap up quick here, uh, conclusion, what we covered, we covered civil skite work scopes, we covered takeoff methods, we covered pricing considerations. Now one thing I would say, the application to new items. So what the, th the methods of taking off what we take off apply to whatever you take off and whatever you estimate because you will always find something that you've never seen before when you estimate. Now, I've, You've worked in you know, 20 plus years, and suddenly we're renovating the Space Needle. It's not something you really see very often. Uh, it's kind of a once in a lifetime type project. Um, but everything I learned, I knew how to do, how to quantify, how to price, how to look at lo 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 the logistics involved in it, is how I used to, to do a, a, the estimate. And you take what you know and apply it to what, what's new, and it's the same methodology and the same thought and that will get you through so that you can use this no matter what comes your way, whatever you have to estimate. It's you know, knowing what units you are, you know, what you need. It's how much of something do you have, and then how much is it going to cost me to put it in place. Um, and whether I need a quote from a vendor or subcontractor, or I'm going to do something myself um, and install it myself, you understand where to get that information. Oh, we have a question, oh, excellent. and I think I just got a question via text as well. Uh, Mayor Mata, this is Rosalind. I'm going to allow you um, to uh, ask your question verbally, uh, so be prepared to ask your question when I turn this on. Go ahead with your question. I believe you're still muted on your end. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Ah, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I don't have a question. It's more of a statement. I want to thank Hoffman, uh, you know, for really, now five years ago, I was sitting where other people are sitting there today to talk about estimating, to look at, you know, what it looks like to estimate a job. And I was sitting right there. And uh, five years later, um, actually, and I'm happy to announce this publicly, but I've um, secured a contract with Hoffman for over seven hundred thousand dollars, and Great. This, these classes that you're going through are very important. Some of it may be over your head, and it was over my head five years ago, to be quite honest. And I never thought I'd get it right. 
And it's not necessarily about getting it right. It's about understanding it. Uh, that's why you end up hiring professionals uh, with your company. But when you first start out, these are very important for you to really focus, look at, break it down. You know, and I'm grateful that general contractors are taking the time. And then we have uh, organizations uh, like the Institute and in er uh, Emerald Green uh, to make sure that, you know, we are getting the training. So thank you very much. I look forward to sharing your training with my foreman, superintendents, and making sure that they're out uh, participating in this class, uh, Dan. So very happy to have participated today. Thank you so much. And I uh, also want to thank uh, uh, Hoffman and their leadership uh, for continuing to push forward and uh, helping us exceed and, and uh, try to scale up. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mayor Mata, and thank you also for stopping in in person earlier. Yes, and I, I just have to echo, uh, you know, Jimmy has, uh, Mayor Mata, excuse me, has uh, just been a wonderful addition uh, to this body, and in fact, Hoffman has uh, uh, really taken an effort to uh, embrace uh, Ahura Construction and actually looking at mentoring yet a third uh, firm and so we're we couldn't be more proud um, earlier in the the presentation you had showed uh, some spreadsheets that you had already populated yes and there are some folks that want to know if you would have uh, any challenges or problems providing uh, some templates that folks could uh, utilize that wouldn't uh, jeopardize any competitive advantage that you know Hoffman has I think that I could work something up absolutely I mean it's most of the stuff is just most of the items are you know just you know length you know general formulas so yeah I've got I have some of those oh. templates um, they're not you know taking off quant how you take off quantities isn't proprietary it's the, the productivity units and that's what's pro pro proprietary. Sure. Well, whatever you would be able to provide us, it would be a great resource. I know that the, the folks on the call and, and here uh, would would find this a, a tremendously yeah. valuable. And, and yeah. Uh, yeah. If, 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 if people have specific um, templates that they're looking for, whether it's trenching, whether it's um, you know just a general takeoff, that, that would help me to make sure that I get something that's uh, useful and, and what will, will help people. Okay, so last thing is uh, future opportunities at Hoffman. We always like to highlight what's coming up. Um, so we've got the following uh, projects that are in pre-construction. Um, the Overlook Walk project, which is part of the uh, waterfront redevelop redevelopment pro in downtown Seattle. It's a cool project. It's, a, uh, it's basically it's a pedestrian bridge that will connect Pike Place Market with the aquarium. Um, going over the uh, the new roads that they're building uh, as in replacement of where the viaduct used to be. Uh, that will start bidding in the fall of this year. Uh, we're also doing um, pool renovation at the uh, IMA at, over at UW. Uh, that's a design build project that we're um, working on and we will start that procurement process in the, this summer and into the fall. And Project S, which is a uh, developer office building in Soto, uh, that is projected to start uh, bidding out work um, late this year and early next year. Uh, other projects that we are pro currently proposing on, uh, but are design build projects, so um, they're traditional design builds, so we have to actually provide a price. So we'll be soliciting for um, quotes and bids uh, in that's part of that process. Uh, the King County Metro, the, it's the interim uh, bus electrification project uh, where they're looking at how you go to all electric buses. Um, that will be start procurement this summer and into the fall. And then also uh, out at West Point Treatment Plant, there's some electrical upgrades that, are going to, that they're going to be doing to uh, improve the plant. Uh, we'll start looking at procurement in this fall as well. Um, and then finally, uh, next class. Uh, one week from today, <laughs> right back here, um, we'll be talking about structural estimating. So uh, that's, we'll be taking a more deep dive into you know, concrete and steel. We'll also be talking about other systems as well and how you estimate that um, and those systems. Um, certainly, uh, I've, it, you know, st structural is near and dear to my heart because I've uh, looking at concrete and managing some concrete projects, some pretty 
um, large concrete projects so uh, and working with our crews to to manage that work so um, making sure that those costs are right has always been something that's very important uh, for me to to do so I hope that uh, if that gets your attention and, and gets your interest come back and and uh, join us next week really excited the the structural you get to the meat of the uh the operations you know and in, in when you're working in construction there's obviously a lot of different sections within the plans um and when uh chris and i and dave were talking about developing this series we really wanted to develop uh uh, uh i guess uh, an enhanced series that would provide exposure to those those trade uh, segments that can really move the dial. And so, you know, there's a lot of people that can paint. Um, and we're going to, you know, provide, you know, some, some um, architectural uh, um, uh, sequencing um, and information on that. But when it comes to those larger dial moving, you know, and those large mega projects, it's typically those projects, you know, or those trades that involve moving a lot of dirt, <laughs> like we just discovered covered today. Uh, there's the structural, you know, the steel and the concrete members and, and other uh, members that are, you know, making it possible for whatever structure to exist. There's big dollars in those. And then you look into the finishes and the architectural, and that's where you, you see some of the smaller trades. But we wanted to really start on the big side, and we also wanted to focus on those areas where Hoffman is really looking f to develop uh, trade partners, and, and that is in these areas that can really help uh, move the dial. And when I say move the dial, I mean include small, diverse firms like ours in these projects that can really help us grow and expand. Sorry. No, no, it's great. Uh, th is that the last slide? Or uh, the last slide, contact? last slide has co our contact information on it. So there's my email, there's Dan's email, and there's Rosalind's email. Um, if you have questions, feel free to e email me. Um, like we said, we will pr provide the slideshow as well. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, this was designed so that you would be able to get that slideshow at the end. That's why we did the snapshots of the actual takeoff so that you can see that systematic approach um, on how to take off those various scopes of work. Um, but if you have questions, if you have requests on other, you know, you want to talk about some of the things that we didn't necessarily dive into, feel free. Um, uh, if you have questions on landscaping or shoring or whatever it is, feel free to email me with the questions and, and we, can, we can talk and I can try to help you in any way I can. Thank you. Thank you. And, and again, we, we are, are so tremendously grateful for Hoffman Construction. And those of you that are online and, and tired of being uh, cooped up at home, you're welcome to come down uh, to our next class face-to-face. -face. We'd love to see your faces, those of you in Washington State. Um, we are uh, going through the, the COVID practices here. Uh, temperatures are, are taken and uh, the, the proper uh, questions are addressed. And so we feel pretty safe. We do encourage those folks that uh, are eligible to take their shots uh, so they can remove their masks and have fun like the rest of us. Um, but again, we just appreciate all of you that participated today. Uh, this uh, class, along with the, uh, the other two classes, uh, will also be a resource that we will share um, but those of you that are present are going to get the, the benefit of asking uh, direct questions to a very talented uh, senior estimator, chief estimator for Hoffman Construction, Chris Bork, Bjork. Let's get a round of applause and uh, say good night. <laughs>